Super quick reminder that there are still some Antu Dutus figures available for pre-order. These are going to be limited and there will not be any more after this initial batch. So click the link in the description below to secure your very own figure before they're gone for good. Bandai Namco has truly become the unsung hero this generation when it comes to people like me who can't get enough cutesy characters, classic gameplay, and worlds of the past getting brand new entries, and more specifically, remakes. Ah, uh, we got a bunch of Taiko games, including the once Japanese exclusive RPGs, Katamari got a remaster, Mr. Driller got a remaster, Pac-Man not only has a dedicated museum, but also a remake of worlds, that's pretty cool, but arguably the most important of all, Klonoa, with the Fantasy Reverie series, containing both Dorta Phantom Isle and Lunatea's Veil, vale, continuing the trend of giving these games titles that are kind of hard to pronounce when you first look at them. Now, one might look at these and say, okay, sure, a couple of old 2D platformers got a re-release. Is that really a big deal? Yes. How dare you ask something so stupid? This game is important. You may not think it, considering Bandai Namco did the bare minimum marketing when this game released, but it's important. I swear to god it's important. Klonoa is one of those franchises that just never took off the way that it rightfully deserved. It's been around for a long time, it's always had its vocal audience, but the character itself never really transcended and passed the threshold to become one of the great platformer icons that he very deservedly should be. It's not like there's a shortage of Klonoa adventures to go on, that couldn't be any further from the truth. You see, with the release of the Fantasy Reverie series, I think many people just assume this was a 1-2 combo pack of a franchise that just happened to die immediately after, during the PS2 era, but no. Look at this ugly abomination we almost got in the late 2000s. This series took a bunch of weird turns that led us to where we are today. We got those two grand story-based platformers on console, but we also got portable adventures with a totally different platformer style, one of which was on the damn Wonderswan, a console I'm convinced 90% of you have likely not heard of until now. The GBA also got a proper action RPG, that's kinda crazy, and uh, there, there's, there's beach volleyball too. Okay, so it's not a perfect franchise, but... And the best part? There is no better time to be a Klonoa fan than right now. The Wonderswan game at Moonlight Museum and the RPG Legendary Star Metal, they never released outside of Japan for their original releases, but amazingly, like right after the Fantasy Reverie series got revealed, BAM! Both of them got full-on English fan translations. Hell yeah. Now, sure, if you want to be nitpicky, it would have been nice for Namco to include these with the rest of the games in the new Fantasy Reverie series release, considering their special anniversary bumper for the trailers does show all of the games, not sure why they couldn't have thrown in a couple of extra ROMs into the collection, but whatever, emulation is truly the only way to experience any franchise in its fullest anyway, now is not the time to be upset about what could have been, because Klonoa is back, baby! It is time to celebrate. Namco did provide a review copy for the PC version of the game, which I definitely appreciate, but even still, I went and bought the Switch version. Couldn't help myself. I have to make sure this game succeeds, okay? By now, you can clearly tell that I'm going to be recommending the Klonoa Fantasy Reverie series on whatever console you want, buy it once, twice, three times, I quite frankly don't care, as long as you play it, you're gonna have a great time. But, since you're here, well, let's talk about the whole series. Klonoa's esteemed history mostly takes place between the years 1997 and 2002, a fairly brief lifespan all things considered. Throughout this time is where all of Klonoa's unique adventures can be found. After that, well, that's when our little long-eared flying rabbit cat hybrid thing was basically in a free fall of broken dreams and a Wii game that I guess will remain a nightmare in Namco's history. They almost got rid of my boy's Pac-Man hat. Yes, that was gonna be the key to success. W what do you mean? But during those times when he was initially relevant, things were great. From the mind of Hideo Yoshizawa, the primary director behind the Ninja Gaiden trilogy on NES, Klonoa entered the scene on the PlayStation 1 with Door to Phantom Isle. And simply knowing that the same person is basically responsible for both Ninja Gaiden and Klonoa just proves that the world is a funny place sometimes. So sit back, relax, and prepare your loudest wahoo, it's time to go over everybody's favorite Alpine Racer 3 character, Klonoa. Wahoo! For a platformer, of course, what's most important is how it plays, and mechanically speaking, 
these games are fine. The framework that began with this game is more or less what we have for the rest of the franchise. We have slower platforming, a bunch of shiny things to collect, with just a couple of special shiny things to collect on top of that, and you hold a wind ring that allows you to grab enemies, inflate them at will, and keep them in eternal pain and suffering and a constant spin above your head, and then you can use them as a means to a double jump or a projectile that you can throw in any direction, even in the foreground and background in the case of the console games. It's pretty good. He smiled, but on the inside, he hurt. These aren't difficult adventures either, but the entire enemy inflation idea really hate saying that out loud really lends itself to clever platforming with opportunities to jump seemingly endlessly as long as you're able to grab the enemies placed properly along the way. These games miss no opportunity to challenge you every now and then for your proper jumping. Especially if you go for the six captured natives in every level, they often are perfectly in eyesight, but are just a matter of testing your platforming skills and reflexes to get them. It's great stuff. However, for Klonoa, it is all about how those levels are laid out. Side-scrolling platforming in a three-dimensional world. Being able to interact with the foreground and background sounds like such a throwaway thing, but amazingly enough, in all of the time since Klonoa's debut, no other platformer series has attempted to replicate and build off of this idea. I mean, Kirby 64? Uh, kinda? And there have been plenty of multi-layered standard stages in games like Mutant Muds or something like that, but this aesthetic is still all Klonoa, baby. I love how basically all of the boss fights in this game take advantage of the 3D space that you're in. It makes for such unique encounters. Again, not difficult, but so memorable. And what an aesthetic it is overall, man. Sure, it's on old and archaic hardware. Fine. Whatever. Shut up. Having these super crisp 2D sprites moving around this low-poly 3D world, god, it's... It's magical. Klonoa has some of the most expressive sprite work that I have ever seen that, despite being in a 3D space, fits in beautifully. Uh, and we got some sweet, crusty 90s CG cutscenes on top of that? Oh, you're speaking my language, Namco. Look at Klonoa's crazy teeth. But you gotta remember, this is the 90s. If you want to be successful, you have to be edgy. And magazine ads roll the rage, right? So let's take a trip on the Wayback Machine and see just what spicy magazine ads we can find for Klonoa. Quite possibly the only thing weirder than your sister. What? Meet Klonoa. He's wacky, he flaps his oversized when you team up with Klonoa. No one stands a chance, someone outside your family who's stranger. Well, I'm sold. But Susan, I have Klonoa. Hey, baby. I want Klonoa. Is, is this... Is this a disease reference? Does she want a disease? I love that this whole time he's just floating around here in a bubble like, yo, you seeing this? Let's see, uh, he's wacky, he flaps his oversized ears to fly, he kills his enemies by inflating their bot kills Oh, man, I miss the 90s. Blow up or shut up. What a, what a tagline. To me, realistically, the biggest selling point of Klonoa is just... Well, the entire idea behind him as a character. Established later on in the story and emphasized in later games, Klonoa is a dream traveler, off to save different dreamy worlds from the nightmares that inhabit them. This allows the worlds in the games that we travel through to be incredibly varied and whimsical and dare I say dreamlike. Hey look, a reverse waterfall, how fun. Accompanied with just some fantastic music, by the way, and stories that actually get pretty dark. I mean, just looking at the start of the game, man. Oh no, a plane crashed. I guess we'll go and see what's up. You cue the super happy music, the bright visuals. Oh hey, a friend, Baloo. <laughs> Jesus! And then in level two, we run through a lit up cave and get to ride a minecart. Great times. But then you finally scale the mountain and... My God, that's terrifying. And we're not gonna talk about spoilers here, but... Oh. Obviously, aesthetics are not the be-all and end-all, of course not, but with a style as strong as this first game, it should really come as no surprise why the Wii remake in 2008 failed to take off. I don't really mean that lightly, by the way. This Wii version sold terribly, reportedly selling less than 6,000 copies in its first week in Japan, my god. Not really sure what the sales are outside of Japan, but have, have you seen the commercials? Get ready for an exciting adventure as you help Klonoa save Phantom Isle. Use the wind bullet to grab your enemies and wig your Wii remote to throw them. And sharpen your battle skills as you face more and more difficult challenges so you can save the world of Phantom Isle. Yeah, it probably sold pretty bad. 
I guess it kind of makes sense. You know, the Wii captured a casual market, and this was a time where games were getting revived like crazy. A Boy in His Blob, Night's Journey of Dreams. Hell, that game is dream-based as well. Why not give Klonoa a shot? But once they considered changing his design and then reverted back to a more classic look due to massive fan outcry, you can tell something was a bit wrong. Because even then, sure, the design is more consistent, props for actually keeping the Pac-Man hat, but why is he so much taller and lankier now? Was trying to fit in with the current Sonic mold really the best idea? But if you try to look past that, it's not like the rest of the experience is that much better. The animations are a lot more stiff, the colors are really muted by comparison, Klonoa barely speaks now, Hupo mostly does the speaking for Klonoa, don't understand that part. And speaking of, they speak English now? What? Oh god, that's disgusting. In the original, they spoke a unique gibberish language, Phantomillion, and it was totally fine. That's still an option here, thankfully, that is the only way to go, but it is clear that they really had a lack of confidence in a lot of the charm the original provided with all of these changes. And it's nothing personal against the guy behind the voice, Eric Stitt, but his portfolio just consists of this and... Ch chick Hicks from Cars? <laughs> okay, that's, that's hilarious. But hey, at the very least, with a brand new release, Klonoa is made accessible once again. And if you're not directly comparing all of these versions together, then this is... This, this is okay. The core adventure is still here, nothing is outwardly broken, it is a functional alternative. Plus, a uh, fun fact, certain copies of the game would even include a certificate for a free taco at Wahoo's Tacos. I can't believe this game didn't sell 10 Phantom Million copies. What's nice, though, is there are some extra challenge stages, too. You see, there's this extra level once you beat the game called Baloo's Tower. It's a pretty solid challenge stage. This was in the original PS1 game. Thankfully, it showed up in the remake, but that's not the only challenge stage in the Wii version. Exclusive to the Mirror Mode, that's really strange, you can find these portals that will bring you to very, very short challenge areas. Uh, sure, why not? I feel like this feature wasn't advertised, but it's here. And you can tell that, like, nobody really played the Wii version all that much because I didn't even know it was there, and I had this game since launch. Even weirder, these stages are nowhere to be found in the recent Fantasy Reverie series release. The mirror mode is not in that game, so... Uh, these stages are exclusive. That's... sure. And yeah, if you didn't figure it out by now, the Wii game is what would go on to be enhanced for the newer release. It's not a new remake, it is just the Wii version with some new textures. Just watching how the cutscenes play out, it is clear that the skeleton of this version is that of the 2008 version. But thank the stars, the art style, the character models, they have all been reworked to fit closer to the original vision. It is so much better. Klonoa is shorter and more adorable, the colors are a lot more vibrant, really showing just how damn muted the Wii version was. And your buddy Hupau, he has his hands back! Why, 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 why did they remove them in the first place? Art style preference is clearly subjective, I get that, but as far as I'm concerned, this is a dramatic improvement. You don't even have the option for the English voice acting anymore, it is just the gibberish. That whole Wii game has been obliterated out of existence, and it is probably for the best. The dialogue also includes a lot more lines for Klonoa to speak, so thankfully he's not like a kind of mute like they made him in the Wii game. That was just such a weird thing. I will say though, I do still think the original PS1 game does a better job conveying charm and personality, especially in the CG cutscenes, because it's not like this new version had these sweeping quality of life improvements that make the original obsolete. They are both totally fine. It would have been nice if the PS1 version was unlockable or something, but hey, enough effort was made to fix the errors of the Wii version, and I can commend that. But I guess that's what the pixel filter they implemented was trying to replicate? It looks terrible. Also, for some reason, the opening jingle doesn't seem to be timed well on the PC version. <laughs> Terrible game, actually. But yeah, like I said before, those extra challenge stages, those are gone, because that old mirror mode is also gone. They are probably in the code somewhere, so it's probably possible to access them in the PC version with a mod or something, but thankfully, you're not really missing much with that exclusion. Whether or not this is the definitive version of the game is entirely up to you, but having it be the most accessible version, I am totally okay with that. And besides, this is still a much easier sell because, of course, you also get Klonoa 2, Lunatea's Veil, included as well. Uh, wa- wa- wahoo. For reasons I refuse to elaborate on because I will start to cry, Klonoa finds himself in a brand new dream world, that of Lunatea. And things seem a lot grander in scope compared to the Phantom I Love before, right out of the gate. 
While the previous adventure had a few main landscapes with a couple of levels each, now we have a large set of kingdoms to explore that are all spread across a big world map in a more immersive way than simply having level 1, 1, 1, 2, and so on. But of course, the land is in danger, and it's up to Klonoa to save the day. I mean, look at these fights in comparison to the previous game's fights. So much grander, all of them. I'm probably a broken record at this point hyping these games up, taking advantage of the 3D space, but it is still so damn cool. And replacing the adorable Hugh Pow as our friend on this journey, we have the combo of Lolo, a priestess in training, and Popka, her dog-like thing, companion. We also now have rivals constantly on our trail with Leorina, a sky pirate looking to gain power using Klonoa's sky ring, and Tet, their cat-like companion that can split into two. This is coming off of the more menacing Gaddius and the loudmouthed Joka from Klonoa 1. And what I'm getting at is the plot and its cast are a lot more compelling this time around. It's... God, it's really, really good. All of the interactions and cutscenes in the first one were certainly charming and filled with emotion, but Klonoa 2 just exudes a whole lot more personality in life, and it focuses on a plot that tells a very strong and surprisingly relatable moral plot with Lolo's path to becoming priestess. Klonoa 1's story certainly goes some pretty crazy places, but 2's plot, I would go as far as to say, is flat out excellent. And that same mentality can be applied to the entire game. Like, mechanically, it's the same. Side-scrolling in full 3D environments, you got the patented and equally terrifying enemy inflation, the perfect amount of platforming challenge and puzzle solving, but everything is simply elevated in many different ways. You got a bunch of new enemy types that open up way more possibilities, like these flying ones that shoot you off into the sky, or these light gem ones, I really like these, they require you to chain multiple enemies in a set way to progress, those are really fun. And the landscapes are much more energetic as well, platforming through cities in the middle of destruction, massive factories with new obstacles around every corner, an amusement park! Not enough platformers have amusement park stages, I will carry this claim until the day I die. Some of these areas do kinda overstay their welcome with more labyrinthian designs that take a very long time to complete, but in general, Klonoa 2 takes the same design philosophy as the first game, but expands it dramatically in a way that is still impressive to this day, with a great story tying everything together. Lunatea's Veil vale is simply an incredible experience, and I'm really trying to not spoil anything here because that is a crucial part of why this game is so good. But dude, uh, we also got hoverboard stages, and maybe I'm simple-minded, but this is enough to get a rise out of me. I love these. Oh, and the music? All rise for our national anthem. Brings a tear to your eye. For both games included in the Fantasy Reverie series, I am actively keeping things vague because they are totally adventures that are worth experiencing with relatively limited knowledge. Just know that they are really fun platformers, maybe not the greatest platformers you've ever played, but all things considered, they are kind of the perfect package. Creative landscapes, fun mechanics, compelling stories, great cast of characters, not lengthy or particularly difficult, but certainly really memorable ones. And I can confidently say that while I may prefer, once again, the PS1 version of Klonoa 1, the Fantasy Reverie series is the best way nowadays to experience these titles. You even get some nice costumes to play around with. You can swap outfits between the two games' main styles, as well as rock a Pac-Man helmet, a Tycho mask, even a Katamari Prince hat. That is awesome. Not really sure why they couldn't get stable camera shots for the costume select screen. Uh, this upsets me way more than it should, but otherwise, fantastic package. But yes, again, you didn't need me to tell you this, but go and play the Klonoa Fantasy Reverie series, you're gonna have a great time, and you're going to be partially responsible for keeping this cat-rabbit thing alive. And then you should play the rest of the games. Listen, the console games are good, very good even, but we can't pretend as if the handheld trilogy doesn't also exist, and they're also very good. And yes, I said trilogy. Empire of Dreams and Dream Champ Tournament, both for the Game Boy Advance, and their predecessor, Moonlight Museum, for the friggin' Wonderswan. It's my first time talking about the Wonderswan on this channel, I am very excited. You likely haven't played, let alone heard, of anything Wonderswan related in the past. That's fair. It was a nifty little handheld in Japan from Bandai of all companies. It had monochrome graphics, it provided super simple games that are Game Boy equivalent, and there would eventually be console upgrades with the Wonderswan Color and the Swan Crystal, which provided some more advanced titles. 
But what's really cool is these consoles had this quirky little feature where you could rotate it 90 degrees and suddenly have a more vertical view without really risking any play control since, hey, we had that extra set of buttons there this entire time. The console gave us early ports of some of the Final Fantasy games, there's Pocket Fighter, two exclusive Mega Man side-scrollers, that's weird. This console is an anomaly, man. And yes, of course, it is the home of a, uh, perfectly fine Klonoa game too. These handheld versions take a slightly different approach to the console games. Mechanically, it is exactly as you would expect, but rather than platforming in these typical linear stages that all try to tell a story as you're playing through them, the portable games are more of a puzzle platformer. Limited collectibles, finding keys to unlock doors, clearly no 3D world for impressive camera angles, and little to no intense platforming to be done here when you're trying to just nail jumps like you do on the console games. It's nice, it's condensed, it does a really good job accomplishing what it's set out to do. Plus, for that Wonderswan game, we have some of that screen orientation shifting thing like I said before, and that's just kinda neat. Probably not the most engaging experience by today's standards, but it's still neat that something like this was done in the late 90s. There is also a story that ties things together where Klonoa and Hugh Pau set out to restore the moon that's been broken into fragments near, of course, the Moonlight Museum, and it is super cool that these now have a full English fan translation, but it's not really needed for this game. You can go into the Japanese version just fine and have a totally perfect experience. If you have any sort of interest in the world of niche retro consoles, definitely check this out. The level design is not mind-blowing, but as a piece of history, this is definitely one to keep your eyes on. But in terms of accessibility, definitely shift your focus more towards the two adventures on the GBA. Wahoo! I'm gonna be honest here, catch me on a different day, you might hear me talking about how these GBA games may actually be a bit better than the console ones. These are fantastic. Something about that puzzle platformer idea, now with a much more vibrant art style, we have polished mechanics, snappy and atmospheric music that sound great, despite coming off of the really crusty GBA speaker. The dreamlike world still feels so immersive despite being on weaker hardware. When it comes to platformers on this handheld, I would argue that you really can't do much better than these. What else you got? You got a Mario vs. Donkey Kong, uh, Pinobi, nah, Klonoa all the way. Now in their own bubble, both of these games are fairly indistinguishable from each other. You have some gimmicks and enemy types that you can find in Dream Champ Tournament that you won't find in Empire of Dreams, but in general, you do get a pretty similar experience that would only be annoying if they weren't so damn satisfying to play through, I adore these games so much. Like the Airboard from Klonoa 2 shows up in both games, but while we essentially have this auto-running segment in Empire of Dreams, we have these fancy behind-the-back stages in Dream Champ Tournament. <laughs> really cool. These are also titles with auto-scrolling levels that are actually really well-designed. And if that doesn't speak volumes, I don't know what does. I hate that trope in most every other game. Plot-wise, the timelines are a little funky here, like having Klonoa 2 Klonoa hanging around Hupo in Empire of Dreams. Kinda strange. Joka is a competitor in the Dream Champ tournament. Okay. Neither Hupau or Lola are powering up your ring in that same game, despite it being established in the console games that you need help from at least one of them to get that power. Uh, whatever, I guess. Some of these characters' inclusions do feel more fanservice-y than anything substantial, but I guess that's kind of nitpicking. The presentations in these games are stellar, all things considered. I am much more interested in the fact that some of these large-scale boss fights are actually doing these really cool things with sprite scaling and stuff. It made the games feel big while still being really small. That's commendable. There are surprisingly well-animated cutscenes for GBA Standards 2. I can nitpick some of those earlier things all I want, but I'm just in awe of what we got here. This is not what I would expect from this console for this genre. The second game in particular introduces a brand new character with Gunts, or Gantz, whatever, that name seems interchangeable, who is a pretty good rival for Klonoa and has an actual gun. Oh, watch out. I just love the world building that continued on with these games, even if timeline shenanigans are in play. If anything, we do have some frustrations, like regularly restarting the float board levels if you miss one of the dream gems, that can get kind of annoying because it is highly likely, or the special suit for some of the water levels in Dream Champ Tournament, which, sure, the art looks really cool, but you traverse slightly slower than in the other levels and that's never a good thing. But really, at the end of the day, you have two stellar puzzle platformers here, and it is pretty upsetting that they couldn't just throw these into the Fantasy Reverie series release just to cover all of their bases. I want more people to play these games. So, however you get your hands on these games, these titles are highly recommended. But then, well, then things get a little weird. Clearly, by this point, Bandai Namco, they must have been getting desperate. 
Sadly, it didn't really matter if the games were as good as they were, and once again, very, very good, they simply weren't all that successful in the marketplace. Two platformers with a strong narrative on consoles, and three platformers on handhelds with a strong focus on puzzles. All great games. Unfortunately, these games just didn't sell all that well. What's to compel the company to keep going if not enough people care? Yes, beach volleyball. That'll... change things? A sports spin-off that has zero relevance to the main games on the PlayStation 1 in 2002, roughly a year after the release of Lunatea's Veil on PS2, and will release it in Japan, Europe, and not America. Perfect? Oh, well, let's make some weird changes to the logo too. That must... Uh, help with the brand recognition, I guess? Maybe Namco saw Klonoa in World Kicks and figured, you know what, sports was the way to go. Definitely the natural order of events here. I just... God, I, I just don't know why this exists. I mean, I guess as a game, it's it's fine. It's properly bright and colorful. It's kind of neat seeing low-poly versions of Klonoa 2 characters and proper 3D forms of the Klonoa 1 characters and even some of the Dream Champ tournament characters like Guns and Chipple. Oh yeah, he was a, he was a character in that game too. He's kind of cute. Uh, that's cool. And I guess it plays fine. I mean, it's volleyball, but the only quirk is you have this special move that only works when it feels like it. But you have to nail shots on the opposing side in specific parts, and then you can accumulate like a powered up super shot. And you can pull it off whenever you want, but I feel like I do it, and then I can't hit the ball. I don't know, it's weird. I went through the tutorial and it's just weird. Ultimately, there's not much to get out of this nowadays. It's just funny to know that this exists. At least they could have done a racing game or something. That would have made more sense. You got the hoverboard races in Klonoa 2. They could have just put every character on a hoverboard. Uh, they put Klonoa in Moto GP. I mean, hey, the idea must have crossed their mind then. 2002 was basically just the company's last ditch effort to get something out of this franchise. Because this was the year that not only did we get beach volleyball, but we also got Dream Champ Tournament in Japan, which is insane to think about actually, because it took three years to get it localized. Okay. But this was also where we got the final original adventure that Klonoa's been on to date. Klonoa Heroes Legendary Star Medal. An action RPG. Well, this is certainly... something. Once again, uh, timeline shenanigans ensue, but don't even worry about the continuity at this point. Klonoa, along with his friends, popping up from both Lunatea's Veil vale and Dream Champ Tournament, go on an adventure to become a hero, as well as take down the evil Garlin and save the day. Because... of course. And you're not alone on this adventure either in terms of playability. You are also joined by the returning Guns with, once again, Guns in tow, and newcomer Pango the Pangolin. Incredible name. The local bomb expert. And that little bit of variety really helps because, uh, yeah, we're not a side-scrolling platformer anymore. Level progression is similar though, we got multiple worlds to go through with a handful of levels each, but now you progress through them as a top-down action RPG. And it's... kinda weird, I'm not gonna lie. A lot of Klonoa's DNA is still all over this. You got a great graphical style, nice music, lovable cast of characters, the whole nine yards. And this time, Klonoa has a sword. That's, that's kinda cool. And the story is even pretty good, you would hope so, since we've evolved from a three to five hour platformer to a close to 20 hour RPG, but credit where it's due, it is a nice time. Every time the characters are on screen, I'm, I'm enjoying scrolling through those text boxes. I just don't really think that this more dungeon crawling, more combat focused gameplay style really clicked for me in this world, even though what's here, it is pretty polished. It's just not really for me. There are plenty of options to level up your characters, balancing the main gameplay with running into town to help townsfolk, that's pretty neat. And even though the combat feels fine, the overall structure is just pretty repetitive in my eyes. I also am not really a fan of how the screen is set up, with everything taking place in this main square with the right side of the screen permanently blocked off with stats and a portrait. Don't like that. I mostly appreciate this game as the cute little black sheep in the series that it is. I always love seeing a franchise try something new, so under that context, Sure, I would still recommend it. This is where the benefit of the fan translation comes in, because until recently, this was the least accessible game in this franchise. That is no longer an issue. So even though I am not that huge into this game, it is definitely worth experiencing just to see every Klonoa adventure to their fullest. And hey, you may like it, you never know. Once again, Klonoa has a sword in this one. That's sick. Drop a wahoo in the chat if you agree. But, yeah, as far as Klonoa is concerned, that's it. 
a handful of really great games that unfortunately just didn't have enough support to be as big of a deal nowadays as they really should be. You know, surprisingly enough, the Japanese exclusive Namco X Capcom that released in 2005 wasn't enough to build up interest. Look, he's in the corner, do you see him? Probably not until I pointed it out. There was also an official webcomic that was made in the mid-2010s, which was certainly cool, if not totally random. But yeah, of course, uh, that was incredibly short-lived too, because... Who cares? We wanted more games, not a bunch of PNGs. Really great stuff. I, I don't deny it, but when the franchise is dead, this really wasn't going to do anything. And that is why the release of the Fantasy Reverie series is so important. Many games across many franchises have released over the years that have acted as a sort of last-ditch effort for relevancy. We got disasters like Star Fox Zero and Chibi Robo Ziplash, who knows if we'll ever see those franchises again. But we also got massive successes that led to brand new adventures, like Crash Bandicoot, SpongeBob with Battle for Bikini Bottom, and Fire Emblem. This is Klonoa's time to break the curse and finally get the appreciation that he deserves. And one can only hope that things do not stop here because then we're going to get another port of Klonoa 1 in 10 years, and I do not want to make the same video again when that happens. So the moral of the story is play more Klonoa. That's it. There's no funny joke at the very end. This is a very serious topic. I would never joke around about anything that's weirder than your sister.